Well, one of the things I'm often reminded of when it comes to Memorial Day is the sacrifice of those who have served in the military, but also the ongoing sacrifice of the family that's left behind. Uh, would you stand with me? We're just going to pray. That might be you and your family uh, lost someone on the battlefield, uh, someone who gave their life for the cause of freedom, for the, even the freedom for us to gather uh, today in faith. Uh, but let's lift up families, not only in this room, but families across our communities and across our nation, that God would just give them an extra dispensation of his grace. Lord God, we are, we are so grateful, so grateful that for every single one of us, Lord, we get to call the United States of America our home. This is the place that, that we're invested in. This is the place that, that is our normal. And God, we recognize throughout human history and even in our modern day that this experiment that was the United States, Lord, is such a gift to the people that get to call her home. And we are so grateful for that. But Lord, we, we know the significance and the cost that comes to secure this freedom. So we lift up the lives, Lord, of men and women throughout the last couple hundred years who have given their life to maintain this freedom. This freedom we have to, to, to speak what it is we, we feel, to share our opinion, this freedom it is, Lord, to, to gather together and to worship and to speak what we believe to be true about who God is and who his son is. And, and the, just the, the litany of freedoms and liberties that we have, Lord, that, that are just not common on a global scale, even today. That so often we could take it for granted, and yet, Lord, we know that came at a cost. We know that there are, there are sons and daughters, husbands and wives, grandsons, granddaughters, brothers, sisters, in this room, perhaps, but also across our communities, Lord, that we're willing to give that ultimate sacrifice the rest of their life without that mom, without that dad, without that brother, without that sister, without that grandma or grandpa. Lord, we're just so grateful that they were willing to pay that cost. We pray, Lord, that you would just give them grace this weekend, that they would be celebrated in various venues that they're a part of, whether it be parades or at cemeteries, that, God, they would just be, that there would tru truly be a heart of gratitude offered, that we recognize the sacrifice that they've made, and we can't imagine it, but we're grateful for it. Lord, for those in this room whose, whose family members are, are in active duty right now, Lord, we pray protection and safety. We know, Lord, that, uh, that our nation has people deployed in various parts of the world for the cause of freedom. Lord, we pray for our leaders that there's discernment and wisdom used in deployment. But for those that are on the front lines, God, we just pray protection and safety, that you would guard them and, and bring them back to their families safely. And for those, Lord, that do make that ultimate sacrifice, that, Lord, your grace would go before them, that your mercy would extend to them, and you'd wrap them up with a community of support around them that would just love them as only you can love, Heavenly Father. And we ask all this in the awesome name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. You know, Memorial Day is a national tradition that has roots dating all the way back to the years following the Civil War. In fact, the birthplace of Memorial Day as we've come to know it today is considered to be just about two and a half hours from here between Syracuse and Rochester in Waterloo, New York, in the Finger Lakes. So if you hadn't picked a place to go on vacation this summer, maybe you choose Waterloo. It began as kind of a self-selective holiday. People could choose if they wanted to commemorate the massive number of lives lost in the Civil War. But during World War I, a transition began to occur where society began to recognize a need to, 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 to memorialize all lives lost in combat for our nation. Then in the years following World War II, as many communities began to adopt and set aside days of memoriam in the month of May... The United States Congress officially set aside the last Monday in May as a federal holiday declaring it Memorial Day, and in 1971 was the first official Memorial Day. Now, often as a part of Memorial Day weekend around the country, people visit cemeteries, holding special honorary events. You know, service women and servicemen pull out those uniforms and they squeeze into them once again. And many of us line the streets in our own communities for parades that honor and celebrate the greatest sacrifice given for our freedom. But those are not the only things that represent culturally our experience of Memorial Day weekend. There's one other big element that has naturally developed over time. And it's never been made official. There was never a vote on the congressional floor to make this a required part of Memorial Day weekend. But for all of us, it's hard to imagine Memorial Day without this one thing. Food. For some of you here, this is going to be the greatest message you've ever heard in your life. 
eating together, right? Firing up the barbecue, inviting people over to the house, getting together with those we enjoy, hanging out, eating together. That fellowship, community is a huge part of Memorial Day weekend. And it kind of brings something to the surface that's profound about human beings that maybe is something you've never thought about before. Have you ever realized when we get together with the people we love more than anything in life, friends and family, it always seems like there's a meal at the center of our time together. Like there's two things we often discuss through text or phone call about leading up to a time together. It's like, hey, what time do we need to be there and what are we bringing to eat? Like those are like the two things. Like there could be board games, card games, hanging out outside, you know, horseshoes, whatever. That stuff will be there, volleyball. But the bottom line is like, what time do we need to be there and what can we bring? What, what are you having? What can we bring? What's for dinner? What are we gonna eat? It just seems to be something that's just a center point, centerpiece for us as human beings. It's kind of the center of our time together. Now, that wasn't something we were taught. It wasn't something we came up with. It just kind of seems to be a part of being a human being. It's this inescapable reality where food and fellowship just kind of blend into each other so well. Chances are you've always done life this way. And yet chances are you never took a class on it. You never really thought about the why. Why is it we always eat together? Why is it eating adds so much to our time in community with those we love? Well, you know, God created us in such a way that our survival is dependent on eating. If you don't believe me, go a few days without eating and see what happens. It's really quite extraordinary how God designed us to consume nutrients in various colors and shapes and textures with a body that's equipped to break them down, digest them, and convert them into the energy we need to survive. Now, God could have designed us any number of ways. He's God after all, right? He could have designed us with with organic solar batteries, and so the sun could charge us up. He could have designed us in any number of ways. But God chose us to have stomachs and to have bodies with digestive systems so that food could be the source of our energy. And to many of us, we say a hearty amen, Lord. But he also designed food as a gift to us, a gift that would grow from the ground, a a task or a duty we'd be assigned, animals we could grill so we could enjoy eating, you know, things like like pork chops and cheeseburgers, right? Things that would grow from the ground like blueberries or corn on the cob or strawberries. I mean, just think about all the wonderful aromas of the best meals you've ever had. Can you smell them? Don't you love them as you put the food in your mouth? There's that explosion of sensation. Right? Sweet, sour, sweet and sour, bitter, salty, sweet and salty. I mean, it's like a party in your mouth, right? And you don't just taste your food, do you? If you enjoy food, you actually experience your food. There's so many textures to experience. You hear it as it crunches. It sloshes around in your mouth. Your stomach almost makes noises echoing this joy that you have. You slurp it into your body. Many people in this room are annoyed by those very sounds, right? You're just like, oh, stop, that's disgusting. And oftentimes we even make noises, right? Mmm, oh, that's good, right? We experience our food. Through all of this, we're nourished, we're replenished, we're strengthened and rebuilt. It's interesting God designed us this way. And it's a fascinating question to wonder about why. Why was it that he designed us this way? Well, food and eating play a pivotal role throughout the Old Testament. It was a fundamental element of worship and the remembrance of who God is, what God has done, and who we are as the created beings. In fact, at the point in history that the Old Testament occurs, there were no supermarkets, no refrigerators. They didn't have chest freezers in their basements with half a cow in them waiting for the barbecue to be turned on. At that point in history, every time you ate a meal, it was a reminder to you of God's provision. And so there was this extreme gratitude throughout the pages of the Old Testament that would enter into worship of God for every meal that they had. And and let's be honest, it's easy for us to become so self-reliant and just kind of lose sight of that reality. Because like today, many of you, if you wanted lobster today for lunch, you could stop at Price Chopper and get lobster. If you wanted pizza, you could pick up the phone tonight and order pizza. If you want a burger, you can put the hamburger out of the freezer tonight into the fridge and make patties in the morning and and strike up the grill tomorrow afternoon. It takes more discipline for us in our context to remember that every meal on the table, 
Every trip to the grocery store, every time we invite people over to share a meal is a moment to be grateful to God for his provision in our lives. To not only provide us with the food itself, because we didn't grow it from the ground, we didn't raise it out in the pasture, some of us do, but, but you provide for the rest of us. And, and, and yet even the ability to earn a wage, God tells us, is a gift from him. He's the provider. What if your friends, your family, made it a point to make every single meal a remembrance and worship experience? Like maybe some of us have just never even been given permission to make eating a worship experience. What if you slowed down enough to remember Jesus at every meal? What if you savored every moment as an opportunity to praise God? And you may say, well, can we do that? Like, does the Bible say we could do it? It does. <laughs> Psalm 34, 8, taste and know the Lord is good. And somebody just got saved again right now, right? <laughs> taste and know the Lord is good. D did you know one of the oddest, most confusing and downright offensive things Jesus did in his entire ministry? It involved eating. Luke, who conducted a bunch of interviews with those who were eyewitnesses to the life and ministry of Jesus, he wrote down what he found historically, historical eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. And in Luke 15, he touches on this. He wrote this. It says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people. Pause. Do you see the exclamation point? Even eating with them. I mean, like, this is outrageous. Who does this? How offensive Jesus was eating with sinful people. The religious elites would never be seen doing such a disgraceful thing as that. To sit down at a table and share a meal with someone that in that culture meant you were the same as them. So if they were lawless, then you were lawless. And if they were impure, you were impure. If they were morally bankrupt, then that would be what, what people would identify you as well. In Matthew 9 and Luke 5, we discover that Jesus invited a tax collector named Levi or Matthew to become one of his 12 disciples. That already is offensive, but then that night, he went over and enjoyed a dinner at Matthew's house with Matthew's friends, all of his degenerate buddies. And when the Pharisees saw this, they brought it up, and they're like, what is your rabbi doing? How dare he? In Luke 19, we hear something very similar from the research Luke did. We find out Jesus uh, reached out to this guy in a tree named Zacchaeus, this wee little man. A wee little man was he. He came down out of the tree. He believes in Christ. Now, all of a sudden, he's invited over to another notorious sinner's house and shares a meal with Zacchaeus and his wicked buddies as well. So Jesus has this pattern of hanging out with the wicked and, and with the, the, the ostracized and alienated, the, the worst of the worst. So, so Jesus would have been viewed as ceremonially unclean just by sitting at a table and associating with these sinners and tax collectors over and over and over again. And those watching were wondering why. Why is a religious holy man with the undeniable power Jesus possesses that, possesses that has to come from God, why is he doing things so outside of what's normal culturally, socially, and religiously? Unacceptable. Well, let's identify some principles here we can gleam about the value of sharing a meal together as Jesus begins to respond to these criticisms or judgments about his philosophy of ministry, the way he, the motives behind his purpose here, who he came to reach, and how it differed so greatly from that of the Pharisees. The first one will continue right in on Luke with what he captures about Levi's life or Matthew's life. When he met Jesus, was invited to be a disciple, then went over to his house for dinner. In Matthew's home, in verse 29 of chapter 5, Luke writes, Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? I love the New Living Translation here. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Jesus establishes that one of his purposes for intentionally sitting down at a table with those far from God is because they're far from God. He establishes that because God sent him to save, that he came to seek and save the lost, he came to give his life as a ransom for many, God the Father sent him to reach those no one else was reaching the hurting, the sick. He will put himself next to those very people so that he can save them. 
The first principle we can kind of pull from the value of eating together is that Jesus ate with those far from God a lot to love them into God's family. We have this core value here at our church that's called share. It's right there in the middle. Found people, find people. We see Jesus living this out. This is Jesus' motive. This is the why behind his what, to welcome them to a table. And in welcoming them to a table, he was breaking down societal walls between him, a rabbi, and them, the scum of the earth. Jesus saw the value in conversation in a circle that would be more effective than them seated in rows listening to him preach. And so he sat down in a circle around a table with a, meal as the, with a meal as the centerpiece, and he entered into relational conversation with people far from God. I mean, Jesus is actively modeling for us, for his church, how we are to live out this mission he gave us. We talked about last weekend. In John 20, 21, he says, As the Father sent me, so I am sending you, church. Jesus sends us to follow his lead. That entering into our communities we live in for outreach and using our dinner table as the primary place of relationship building with those furthest from God is immensely effective. And I would just ask you, when was the last time you sat across the table from someone far from God in your kitchen, in your dining room, and your intentional purpose for inviting them to the table was to build a relational bridge because you know Jesus, you could bring Jesus close to them in your home. When was the last time? It wasn't just to have them over, but it was to have them so, so God could use you to build a deeper relational bridge and they could begin to experience the love of Jesus Christ. Mealtime is an excellent place. I, I would argue the most effective place to love people into the kingdom of God is your kitchen table or dining room table. I think that's the way it was 2,000 years ago in the first century. We'll get into the book of Acts here in a minute. But for the gospel mission to be lived out, one of the most effective places for it to happen is around the table. The second thing, we can stay right here in Luke 5. Not only did he eat a lot with those who were far from God, because they were far from God, he wanted to love them into God's family. The second thing we see is in the very next few verses. Because after this, we're given clarity by Luke about Jesus' purpose for sitting and eating with these sinners. He draws attention to a broader topic about religious devotion and discipline in relation to eating. Not just the audience Jesus eats with, but eating in general, an idea of fasting. In Luke chapter 5, verses 33, the very next verse, Luke says, One day some people said to Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray regularly. And so do the disciples disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? Like, it's a good question. I I look at this sect of, of Judaism, John the Baptist, and... They pray and fast a lot, and and I look at the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and they pray and fast a lot, but Jesus, your disciples, they're always eating and drinking, to which I would say, I want to be in that group. I want to eat and drink, but so Jesus, there's something we don't understand here. Can you make sense of it? You're a Jewish holy man. You're a rabbi, and there's a difference in approach. Why? So Jesus responds, where he introduces this idea. He introduces this idea for the first time in the book of Luke of a groom and a bride, and him being the groom, and the church being his bride. He responded, do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. Have you ever went to a wedding and said, yeah, I'm going to skip this meal? (laughs) You're going to miss out on a pretty good meal, right? Because like, if there's a meal where normally it's the best of the best somebody can prepare and present, it's a wedding feast, right? I mean, there, there's so many parallels in the pages of Scripture to the, the beauty of a wedding feast and a guest of honor at a wedding feast. So do you fast? I mean, if you're in the middle of a fast and you've got a wedding, you're like, oh, this is going to be tough. This is not going to be good, right? You're, you're just eating, you know, just the protein. You don't get any of the good stuff with the butter or whatever. So, so he says, do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. He's drawing this parallel between him, the groom, and the church as his bride. But someday the groom will be taken away from them And then they will fast. Then Jesus gave them this illustration. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and uses it to patch an old garment. For then the new garment would be ruined. And the new patch wouldn't even match the old garment. It doesn't even make sense. See, fasting by the religious leaders, especially at this period in time, was often done in penance and mortification of sin. It was an act of self-denial that was routine and regular weekly. And Jesus is saying at this moment in time, the groom has arrived to be joined to the bride. There is cause for celebration. In fact, up till this moment in Luke chapter five, it's early on in Luke's gospel, aside from some tension with religious leaders, 
At this point in the ministry of Jesus, his disciples haven't really faced much opposition. In fact, they're celebrated. Jesus is kind of a celebrity. People are flocking to see him and hear him, and they want him to heal them. Most communities, when Jesus arrived and his disciples, they were excited, like, hey, did you hear? Jesus is here. The rabbi Jesus is here. Oh, I'm dropping whatever I'm doing. I'm going to go listen to this guy. So Jesus says in response to this question, right now there's cause for celebration. There is a season of celebrating that should be done right now because of the groom's arrival, because of Jesus' arrival. When the bridegroom has finally shown up after generations of God making this promise, there is a reason for a reception to welcome and worship God for his faithfulness to us. And basically the principle here is that Jesus would eat with his disciples a lot as a part of their discipleship journey. It was a part of their growth that as they were walking with Jesus, they would sit down and share meals regularly and it was even noticeable by the people on the outside. They're always eating and drinking. They're always celebrating and Jesus would use those environments to share with them the truths about who God is. He would eat with them as a part of their discipleship journey and it's one of those other core values, grow. People walking with Jesus change. But Jesus also identifies the time will come when prayer and fasting will be required. We know that before Jesus' death, he himself would be laboring in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, inviting Peter, James, and John to join him in that prayer because of the weight of the sin of the world. We know that when Jesus dies, the disciples' hearts will be full of grief and loss. They won't know where to turn. They'll lean on each other and they'll seek counsel from God. They'll pray. When Jesus ascends to heaven, although it's a joyful moment, they still are kind of bewildered at what's happening and why he's leaving and who is this Holy Spirit that's going to come. Jesus leaves the disciples and he leaves us today still with work for our hands. This mission he's given us. And at the dawn of the church's existence in the book of Acts, as extreme persecution sets in against Christians, regular fasting and prayer will be observed in a very devout manner just out of necessity to survive. Jesus ate with the lost to reach them. He ate with the disciples to grow them. And for the last principle, number three, we're going to move to the days of the early church in the book of Acts. And we're going to see how they lived out this model set by Jesus regarding meals. What Jesus showed them about sharing meals together, how did they live that out in the earliest days of the church together, the formation of the church? How did it impact their gallant gatherings together? Well, you know, if you look at 2018 and you look at really the last couple of hundreds of years in human history, in our day, the dominant aspects of churches gathering together is often for a worship service, like today, a worship experience that occurs on Sundays. And two of the biggest elements are singing and preaching. Now we also pray together and we use our gifts and talents in service to each other like the great baked goods and coffee and people welcoming us at the door and smiling when we didn't want to get up early this morning and, sh and serving our kids you know, incredibly well and, 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 and you know, participating with gifts and music and, and we interact with others in fellowship. All those things are part of the church gathering together as well. But singing and preaching are the two elements we spend the most time together doing. Like if you came to the church and, and you just fellowshiped and you just uh, ate some snacks and you said hi to somebody at the door, you wouldn't necessarily define that a worship service. But if you came and you were singing and there's preaching, you say, yeah, it was, a, it was a worship service whether it was on Sunday or not. So that's often how we kind of break down or think about the dominant aspects of the church gathering together. But in the first century for the early church, there was another element of their gathering that was pivotal. It was very dominant. So dominant, in fact, that in Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47, when Luke shares with us what the early church was doing as the church, listen, food pops up three times. Everything else only pops up once. He says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the, fe and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, there's food again, and receiving their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Do you see how closely eating together was tied to community and faith journey and corporate gathering for worship. Specifically, they were gathering, it says, in each other's homes. They were leaving the sanctuary. They were gathering in each, home, each other's homes, which means they would attend temple together, and they would engage in worship, their, their, uh, uh, um, the ways in which they would worship, 
2,000 years ago would look different than ours today. They would attend temple together. They would participate in the religious rituals, the corporate worship. Then that worship experience would kind of overflow into their homes, and they would leave the sanctuary and enter into their kitchens and living rooms where worship would continue. The emphasis here in Acts chapter 2 is not worship and mission. It's not worship and evangelism. It's not worship and soul winning. It's worship and eating. It's worship and gathering together to enjoy food, to enjoy a meal. Jesus built a community of people engaged in life-on-life relationships with each other who loved to eat together. And from the outside in, what happened in the first century is incredible. From the outside in, people began to see this fellowship, this community that was rooted deeply in faith in Jesus. But they saw these people that loved to be together They saw this new expression of community. They experienced a love and generosity exhibited by these Jesus followers in a way they'd never seen in their culture before. And because it was so new in their isolated, lonely world, people were compelled by the gospel being lived out. They were drawn. And Luke tells us that daily new people wanted to become a part of it. Daily, people were being added to the fellowship. So enjoying meals getting together, fellowship. They were practically the same thing in the first century. And if you really look at what changed the world in the first hundred years, it wasn't dynamic preaching or inspired worship. It was a new definition and depth of relationships that was being expressed by the power of the Holy Spirit, gathering and eating together and leaning on each other through the persecution they were experiencing. The first takeaway is that Jesus ate with those far from God a lot to love them into God's family. He he ate with the lost to reach them. Jesus ate with his disciples a lot, discipling them as a part of grateful worship to God. And Jesus' church ate together a lot as a core element of their faith journey in a hostile world. They were eating together to connect with each other and lean on each other. We all have to eat. Can't escape that. Maybe you've never thought about it this way, but, but here's the question. Does your eating have purpose or is it just eating? Because as a follower of Jesus, there's a precedent for our meals. 21 of them we have a week. Do they have purpose and intention? Are you reclaiming your dinner table to share your faith with those seated there that don't know your Savior? Building an ongoing relationship? Are you reclaiming your dinner table to worship God for his provision to present before you What you didn't earn or deserve, but he gifts it to you. Are you reclaiming your dinner table to grow together and be discipled in faith together? Are you reclaiming your dinner table to connect deeper in relationship with each other, with those you cherish? You know, here at Fusion, we continually hear about the people that make up this community. The way that that people feel loved and and accepted, not judged, not ostracized. The way people are are just getting so connected to each other, and, and it's incredible But it's also why our fellowship must continue to expand with more and more people. And because we've been given a mission that we talked about last week, a mission God the Father sent Jesus to accomplish, to seek and save the lost, and then Jesus himself sends us out in the same way as Father sent him to accomplish it now. And the beautiful thing is we don't accomplish the mission of Jesus in our power. We accomplish it in the Holy Spirit's power. We know that our faith community must continue to expand as well. Our dinner tables must expand. And not just here in one location, Because there are definite geographic boundaries to being in one location. But we talked about last week, what would it be like if other areas around us, a short distance away, could experience the kind of faith community being lived out, living out the implications of the gospel, if other communities around us could experience that presence as well, an open door to something in their backyard, a group of believers living out the implications of the gospel. How might God lead your heart my heart, to be a part of creating another fusion community church, congregation, access point for community in a neighboring location, they may not even realize how desperately they need one. And so last week I gave you four options to respond with. The first one may be to pray. If you weren't here for Vision Sunday last week, I strongly encourage you to go to the podcast or jump on Facebook or YouTube and, and, and go back to the message as we talked about the future for us as a church. But I gave four responses. The first is to pray. Um, In the same way, I'm kind of challenging you to be more intentional about the dining room table. Also be intentional the times you're in the car driving through communities in our area. 
Are you praying, actively praying for the houses and the lost people you're driving by, the families, the kids that are represented there? Are we just consumed with our agenda and schedule or are we actively praying about the future, praying for the lostness of our region? That's the first response. God, break our hearts for these people. God, send, send uh, harvest workers into the harvest field. The second response is go. Will you start to ask God if he might be leading your heart to go and be a part of launching a new campus somewhere in our region in the next couple of years? Is God leading you to go on a discipleship journey of taking the gospel into another location, connected to fusion, but in a whole other region? A third response would be to lead. Maybe you'd say, you know what, I feel like God's wanting me to intentionally invest myself here in an area of ministry that I'm passionate about and wired for, so that when the day comes to launch another access point for the church, that you might be the one God's tapping on the shoulder to lead, in another, lead that ministry in another location. And then the fourth one deals with the, the resources. To reach one more, it's going to have a cost. Uh, on your seats today as you came in, there's a card that says Multiplication Vision Fund. You can see it up there on the screen. This is a way for all of us collectively to start stockpiling resources and faith for this future multiplication. Now let me be very clear here. I'm not asking you to give. I'm asking you to ask God if he would have you to respond in one of these four ways. I believe God has something for you to respond with. I believe if you're passionate about what he's doing in your faith journey through the church that you're a part of, I believe he's got a next step for you to take. And it may not make sense. You may say, I don't, God's tapped me on the shoulder to lead. I don't want to lead. You may say, God's tapped me on the shoulder to pray. I don't even know how to pray. But it may not make sense, but that's what faith is all about. I want to invite you just to bow your head and close your eyes. I want to pray for you. I want to pray over your kitchen table and dining room table. I also want to pray over the next step God's calling you to take. Because this community that we're a part of called Fusion Community Church and the vision and mission God's given us for this, the burden for this region requires us to multiply. You know, in the first century, the great commission that Jesus gave, he very clearly said, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. He gives us this understanding that the church from its inception is to multiply and to start in Jerusalem and move to Judea, Samaria, and then the ends of the world. And even though that the church is a global entity today, it's not truly global in that there's not a transforming presence of a congregation in every single zip code in North America. There's just not. And so it, 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 we're compelled to ask God, God, what role would you have us to play? Seeing our population continue to increase and seeing the number of churches in our culture continue to close, there's this massive gap developing that God's calling us to step into. What doors might God start to divinely open? As we act on faith together, his dream for this region is to reach many, many one more for Christ using us. What sacrifices might we be willing to make weekly or monthly, financially or time-wise, to be a part of a discipleship, disciple-maker group, to prepare to lead, to grow in our faith, what kind of sacrifice we make to take the long way home so we can intentionally drive through neighboring communities to pray? What doors might God begin to divinely open when we act in faith together, believing that God's dream for this region is to reach many, many one mores? You know, along the way, there'll be many opportunities for us to be together. To, so let's follow Jesus' example and make many of those times together occur around a reclaimed dinner table for evangelism and outreach, for discipleship and growth, for worship because of God's provision, and for connecting in community with each other. God, we're so thankful that your grace and acceptance of us in our sin is the, the wildest, most boundless force in all the universe. Your grace, God, it just doesn't make sense. And it's all because of your awesome, overwhelming, reckless love. That God, you were not concerned with yourself or with the safety of Jesus, but he came specifically to lay his life down as a lamb led to slaughter. And like a mom or dad willing to pay any cost to rescue their child, Lord, we are so incredibly grateful that you gave your life for us, that you came and you carried our sin on the cross and paid the ultimate penalty. So God, would you help us today when we go home 
when we walk into the kitchen, when we walk into the dining room and we see the table and chairs, may we think of you. May we think about the fact, Lord, that you don't stay here in a church building, but Jesus, you go where we are. As followers of Christ, your Holy Spirit resides within us. We are your temple now. And would you help us to see that the worship center here, the sanctuary here, is no more holy than the dining room table or the kitchen table at home. That discipling of our children, discipling of each other, worship can happen there, God. That even as we taste and know and see the Lord is good, we can worship you. That we can connect in relationship and build community with each other. That God, we can even invite the people that are far from God into our homes because they're far from God. Not seeing them as a project or agenda or something we've got to check off. Not seeing it as a duty or an obligation, but looking at it as Jesus did. It's a gift because each life is a gift. Each soul is a gift, God. And you've placed us in proximity of people that desperately need the overwhelming, reckless love of a holy God. We know the harvest field is plentiful, Lord. We know you've sent us to this field to plow the ground and prepare for the time of harvest. Lord, may you help us to be courageous and faithful in the task you've assigned us. And would you invite us into deeper relationships with each other and may those relationships grow deep around community tables of fellowship and eating together, just like the early church, where it would define and be noticeable by our community around us and it would draw people in. In your holy name we pray, amen.